United States stands at this time at the pinnacle of world power. It is a solemn moment for the American democracy. For with primacy in power is also joined an awe-inspiring accountability to the future. At the heart of U.S. foreign policy is a deep-seated ambivalence. Some American leaders, believing that global problems must have global solutions, have put their faith in institutions with worldwide mandates. Others have derided those same organizations as ineffectual and have asserted that America ought to stand alone. Great Decisions examines the perils and promises of multilateralism and asks whether global cooperation can endure in an era of nationalist retrenchment. The end of the global order? Next on Great Decisions. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association in association with Thomson Reuters. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Hereford Foundation, PricewaterhouseCoopers, LLP, and the Nelson B. Delavan Foundation. Every four years, American voters head to the polls to elect a president. At issue is not just who will occupy the White House, but how actively the U.S. will engage with the rest of the world. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. America is back, ready to lead the world, not retreat from it. In his four years in office, President Donald Trump pulled the U.S. out of a host of multilateral institutions. The Trump administration announced today that it will withdraw the U.S. from UNESCO, the United Nations body that protects global cultural heritage, in response to its designation of the old city of Hebron as a Palestinian World Heritage Site. In a joint statement this afternoon, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley said the U.S. will no longer participate in the U.N. Human Rights Council. Today, President Trump formally notified Congress of his intent to withdraw the U.S. from the World Health Organization, the international agency responsible for fighting disease. One of the things that the United States is, is we're still the biggest player on the block. Now, we shouldn't yield to the second biggest or the third biggest or, or worse. We need to pick our alliances carefully, make sure that there are enough shared values that we can feel comfortable with that partnership. The United States stepping back from that position of international leadership loses U.S. influence. If we leave the table, there are other countries who are quite happy to take our seat. Three quarters of a century has passed since the end of World War II ushered in a new system of multilateral commitments. Now, in an era of rising nationalism, the institutions that were built to bring the world together are being tested. Now, I've been worrying about different aspects of the world for some time and have concluded that we are now on a hinge of history sort of comparable to what the people at the end of World War II faced. I think going forward, the real question is, what is, what is the norm? Is the last 75 years the norm and Donald Trump the aberration? Or in some ways, was the last 75 years something of the exception and Donald Trump was a harbinger of a return to America's tradition of holding back from the world? I don't have the answer to that, but a lot of history will depend on that answer. Today, the General Assembly will take up sub-item A of Agenda Item 105 of the election of 14 members of the Human Rights Council. In 2006, the UN approved the formation of a body dedicated to the protection of human rights around the world. 
but George W. Bush kept the U.S. out of this new council. The idea was that it had been become so dominated by anti-human rights members that it was, uh, it was nowhere close to fulfilling its mission. It was clear that it would only be a matter of time before the new Human Rights Council would have the same defects as its predecessor. And that's exactly what happened. There really isn't a whole lot of, uh, of evidence in terms of impact uh, of the Human Rights Council in terms of addressing grave human rights situations around the world. The tough cases, those are the ones that the Human Rights Council needs to be focused on, and those countries often ignore the Human Rights Council, even if they're a subject of its resolutions at all. When President Barack Obama took office in 2009, the U.S. finally joined the U.N. Human Rights Council. The logic behind the Obama administration being in the U.N. Uh, Council on Human Rights is to be at the table to try to make it better. It is very fraught, but if we aren't there, then our voice is not there, our values are not there, our purpose is not there. This was not a naive, idealistic decision. This was based on a very pragmatic assessment of the costs and benefits of engagement versus non-engagement. The idea that the United States would cede leadership on human rights without even taking a shot at this new institution, I think that that was just untenable for the Obama administration. After eight contentious years, experts disagreed whether U.S. participation had paid dividends. And I'm proud to say that today, the Obama administration's leadership at the Human Rights Council has delivered real results. They were successful at the margins. Uh, they were able to make some resolutions uh, less troublesome or, or less onerous or less uh, hypocritical than they otherwise might have been. But again, you still don't see the Human Rights Council under the Obama administration truly focus on those countries that need to be criticized. You didn't see resolutions condemning Cuba. You didn't see resolutions condemning Russia. You didn't see resolutions condemning China. The results of our engagement at the Human Rights Council uh, far exceeded anyone's wildest dreams. We had four special sessions on Syria. We were very engaged in the creation of a commission of inquiry on North Korea, LGBT rights we got onto the agenda, and that had been inconceivable just a short time earlier. I think there's a real question, absent U.S. leadership on the Human Rights Council, whether the Human Rights Council ever would have set up uh, a human rights special rapporteur for Iran to actually investigate and hold accountable the Iranian government for its human rights abuses domestically at a time when the U.N. Security Council was blocked by the Russian veto. In 2018, President Trump reversed course. Once again, the U.S. refused to take part. When I arrived, and still today, its members included some of the worst human rights violators. The dictatorships of Cuba, China, and Venezuela all have seats on the council. Another criticism uh, that the Trump administration made of the Human Rights Council is that it is biased against Israel. And that is evidently true. If you take a look at the number of condemnatory resolutions passed by the Human Rights Council, nearly half of them are focused on Israel. To think that Israel is the source of half of the world's human rights problems is simply ridiculous. China has never been criticized or been the subject of a condemnatory resolution by the Human Rights Council. I think taking human rights seriously is important. You don't have to do that through a council that, that's two principal targets are Israel and the United States. I'm not saying the U.S. has a perfect record on human rights, but we're a democracy. I mean, we're, we're presumably capable of correcting these problems ourselves. We don't need a nanny in Geneva lecturing us. The way the U.N. Human Rights Council has is, is evolved is, is a travesty. Um, and I can see why the Trump administration would say uh, we're not going to have anything more to do with this. The question is, does it help? Do you want to throw your toys out of the pram and just not be there at all? I think the view of the British government is it's better to be inside fighting that case than to say we leave. 
With the U.S. on the sidelines, China worked tirelessly to expand its influence within the UN Human Rights Council. Those efforts secured international support for controversial policies in Xinjiang and Hong Kong. There was a recent episode where China was successful in building a coalition to support its narrative about its role in Hong Kong. And this is a perfect example of where if the United States had been present, we would have uh, been able to work the halls and find more country support and really change the narrative about whether China actually does have the support of the majority of countries. What we've seen in recent years is China increasingly using its vast economic leverage to try to bring countries to its side within the UN. It's not facing much competition. It's incumbent on liberal democratic nations that believe in human rights to mobilize coalitions of countries so that China can't just waltz into the United Nations, uh, mobilize its coalition, and then go uncontested. American policymakers who hope to challenge China's global ambitions must determine whether to work inside or outside of existing institutions. The universal principle, I believe, is this. If America unilaterally withdraws from the UN and multilateral institutions, it simply creates a bigger slice for major non-democracies like China to exercise even greater influence in the future. Far better the United States remains in and prosecutes in each of these agencies a uh, general reform program to make them as effective and as efficient as possible. Multilateral organizations are always going to have a hard time agreeing on certain principles because you have this diversity of cultures and values and forms of government. I mean, you know, on the one hand, you have China, which has an emperor for life, and then you have the United States, which is laissez-faire. And when you have those extremes and then all the diversity in between, it's always going to be difficult, which is why multinationals are always frustrating to Americans. We have dozens of countries around the world who are at least open to and prepared to, to, to work with us. China d d does not have that for the most part. So I don't look at these institutions as somehow biased against the United States. And, and even in those occasions where they might be, that to me is a challenge for foreign policy. How within them do we build coalitions? That's why God invented diplomats. Let us not fail to grasp this supreme chance to establish a worldwide rule of reason, to create an enduring peace under the guidance of God. Today, the Allied world salutes these representatives of 50 nations. They have made a beginning, a brave beginning, that can build a mighty structure for peace. When World War II ended, the U.S. championed the formation of the global order we know today. The United States was the architect of so many of these multinational organizations. You know, they came out of, in, in so many ways, a devastated world in 1945 uh, and a belief by Americans that the way to avoid catastrophic wars in the future was to create international institutions that were basically channels for dialogue and problem solving. That was a very different world, a very different United States. Balance of power, distribution of power was far different. These institutions now have 75 years of a track record, not always, shall we say, glorious. Even as the U.S. government embraced multilateralism, a strong undercurrent of skepticism ran through American politics. I just say the hell with the U.S. What is it? The U.S. can afford to be much more self-sufficient and independent than just about any other nation in the world. America always kind of stood a little bit to her side on these things, and it was given the permission to do that because most Western nations thought, look, we don't mind if America does its own stuff now and again, uh, as long as it's inside the multilateral institutions when we need it to be. 
Well, I suggested on the floor of the Senate today that we stop all funds for the United Nations. Now, what that'll do to the United Nations, I don't know. Uh, I have a hunch it would uh, cause them to fold up, which would make me very happy at this particular point. Well, in the United States, uh, like in Australia and other Western democracies, it becomes an item of political sport, particularly within the political right and far right, to just go on a general campaign of UN bashing. Why do politicians do that? It's because this attack on globalism, this uh, straw man argument, uh, has become a part of the identity politics of the right and the far right. Globalism exerted a religious pull over past leaders, causing them to ignore their own national interests. Today, the world looks very different from the circumstances of 1945. It is not so easy for bureaucratic institutions to evolve rapidly to face new challenges. It's going to be very hard to see those organizations change. It's not that people don't know how they should change. It's that the major powers that comprise these institutions have to be prepared to bring their publics along. There's no magic wand that can be waved by the citizenry uh, on their own or by the secretary general or by any particular country. What is the point of pretending that the organization is still committed to its original uh, principles? Uh, and if that tension means that the organizations don't work, as many parts of the UN system didn't work during the Cold War, that's unfortunate, but then that ought to lead people to say, what are the alternatives? Not just keep plowing along as if the problem didn't exist. You have seen over the history of the UN a surprising degree of innovation in looking at new ways to solve problems as they confront them. Something like peacekeeping was not in the UN Charter. The UN invented it when they had to in the middle of the Suez Crisis in 1956. So there are all kinds of ways that the UN working with partners needs to look at solutions in innovative ways. When organizations depend on consensus, a member state that refuses to live up to its commitments can spark frustration and recrimination. In the early days of the WTO, we tried to operate uh, fully by consensus. We're now at 164 members, and deciding every single thing by consensus has become unmanageable. So what members are doing, they are figuring out how to advance the most sensitive issues Flexibility is the only way I think uh, the WTO can continue to upgrade itself in a, in a progressive and quick enough manner. To the extent that international organizations deal with political issues, you're going to see uh, further gridlock as the member states disagree. And you saw this during the Cold War when the United States and the Soviet Union were often at odds. The staunchest defenders of the multilateral order insist that institutions are merely forums where member states can interact. It is up to those individual countries to learn to cooperate. There is no other forum where this is going to disappear. Uh, whatever forum, whatever setup you design, uh, you're still going to have different opinions. It's not changing the name of the forum or the place of the forum or the countries that are inside the forum, that it's going to change the outcome. Richard Holbrook used to say about the UN that blaming the UN for a crisis is like blaming Madison Square Garden when the New York Knicks play badly. When are we going to get the kinds of reforms of these organizations that we need to make them fit for purpose in the 21st century? When the governments that comprise UN bodies are willing to back those reforms. Throughout American history, policymakers have feared that the empowering of international institutions might impinge on national sovereignty. I, I do not recognize higher law than the Constitution in temporal terms. I'm leaving religion out of this. We are sovereign, uh, and the Constitution provides uh, no opportunity to delegate that sovereignty uh, to some international body. 
My own view is that there's a false dichotomy that's often created between sovereignty and cooperation. One of the best ways to advance the sovereign interests of any country, including the United States, is by working with allies, working with other partners where you share common interests. And that's really how these institutions were created and what they're for. Today, politicians who worry about the loss of sovereignty have mounted fierce opposition to American participation in the International Criminal Court a tribunal founded in 2002 to prosecute individuals for crimes against humanity. I've said before, the happiest day of my entire government career was the day that I unsigned the Clinton administration's signature on the Rome statute creating the ICC. I think it's a thoroughly illegitimate institution. We don't recognize any international authority uh, to judge American citizens. We judge American citizens. I received word this morning that the ICC Appeals Chamber authorized an investigation into the activities of the Taliban and U.S. and Afghan personnel there. This is a truly breathtaking action by an unaccountable political institution masquerading as a legal body. Our nation and this administration will not allow American citizens who have served our country to be subjected to illegitimate investigations. There are, I think, real and legitimate concerns about the International Criminal Court and about its jurisdiction and how it could be used to affect American diplomats, American uh, servicemen. The ICC was not designed for situations where a country had a, a robust legal system. Those who champion global institutions face an urgent question. How to present an effective case for multilateralism to skeptical voters. The key challenge for any national political leadership uh, is on matters of uh, global governance to explain to their domestic political constituencies our membership uh, of these international institutions primarily in terms of their ability to advance our domestic national interests and then you argue and by the way it helps the world as well. The challenge with a narrow form of nationalism, a kind of insularity of worldview that leads you to believe that you can close your borders and solve your problems, is that the facts are not going to respect that ideology or that way of governing. We're not gonna set back the clock, right? You're not gonna see the end of global air travel or the end of global commerce. The good news is compared to 1945, we've got democracies on every continent. We have nations that are moving more and more toward respect of, of democratic values. But we also have democracies that are stressed. The authoritarian nations in the world moved into a new chapter of trying to promote the idea that authoritarian uh, governance models are the right ones for the 21st century. I think we have to rebut that critique, not just by trying to be a strong democracy in the United States, but by pulling democracies of the world together. Those non-Americans who have observed the shifting attitudes of the U.S. government most closely are optimistic that multilateral organizations can function effectively even without U.S. participation. I watch very carefully the World Health Assembly, which is the highest decision-making body of the WHO. The European Union was the one that was stepping forward and proposing really sort of drafting all of the key decisions. Um, that's a role that historically, I think, the United States often had. But with the U.S. absent, it was Europe that was able to bridge the different gaps. I call for like-minded countries uh, in Europe, in Asia, and in the Americas to triage the institutions of multilateral governance until we re-establish a level of um, uh, geopolitical equilibrium between China and the United States. The ball, I think, well and truly lies uh, in the court of uh, an incoming Biden administration. But I do think this is the last chance saloon for American global leadership. It may be that we'll look back again at this and say the idea that you need a country to lead us out of a crisis is a very 20th century notion and that uh, leadership has become much more fragmented, diverse, as has power. Uh, and therefore, we shouldn't be expecting America or any country to come up and lead. Since 1945, the world has learned that multilateralism is messy, tedious, frustrating, and imperfect. Partnerships form, 
and dissolve and institutions come and go. But at a time when emerging threats can so easily cross borders, the nations of the world have little choice but to find some way to work together. Great Decisions is America's largest discussion program on global affairs. Me? Yes, I can see you well. Oh, hey. Well, thank you very much, David, for running the film. I, I must say the film took rather a broader approach to the, today's topic than I was expecting. I thought that it would be more narrowly focused on economic issues, but obviously looking at uh, multilateralism and uh, multinational institutions writ large into which, of course, uh, uh, worldwide economics certainly fits. And to discuss worldwide economics today, we couldn't have a better guest than Dr. Ann Kruger. Uh, she is, as I mentioned earlier, the author of the article that we read. And uh, currently, she's also the Senior Research Professor of International Economics at the School for Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. She's also a senior fellow of the Center for International Development and professor of sciences and humanities in the economics department at Stanford University. With her bachelor's degree from Oberlin College and master's and PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Dr. Kruger has had a distinguished academic career teaching at the University of Wisconsin, the University of Minnesota, Duke University, MIT, Northwestern University, and five foreign institutions in addition to her current positions. Beyond the campus, Dr. Kruger has served as Vice President for Economics and Research at the World Bank and first Deputy Managing Director at the International Monetary Fund. Dr. Kruger is a distinguished fellow and past president of the American Economic Association and a senior research fellow of the National Bureau of Economic Research. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Econometric Society, and the American Philosophical Society. She is also the recipient of numerous awards and prizes. Dr. Kruger has also published extensively on economic and development, international trade and finance, and economic policy reform. Most mo notable in terms of today's discussion is her 2012 book entitled Struggling with Success, Challenges Facing the International Economy. Dr. Kruger, we're indeed honored that you've accepted our invitation to join us today, and we extend to you the very warmest of welcomes. Professor Kruger, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? We can indeed. Okay, good, thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and I'm looking forward to uh, the discussion afterwards. So I'll make a few remarks now on things that I think are important. I had not seen the film ahead of time and so there was no chance in a sense to prepare for that. But in fact, <clears throat> I think it formulated the questions in a reasonably sensible uh, and acceptable way, both economic and others. On the other hand, I think it was a little bit on the pessimistic side because when we talk about globalization, we are talking about something that really has been going on in the history of mankind. It has always been part of us. It's not something that <clears throat> happened recently. It started from a time way back when, uh, when people didn't communicate very much with each other because of course they had no telephones, no, no internets, no televisions or anything like that. And they were remote because in fact they were hunting in different grounds, et cetera, et cetera. Over time, what has happened is as technology has changed, as economics have changed, we as a people have learned. And as such, uh, the globalization has been something that's been ongoing ever since. The first migrations from Africa into Europe are thought to have happened in the Neanderthal year, <coughs> man's day. We certainly think there were migrations from Tahiti to Hawaii, certainly across the Bering Strait from uh, Russia, Northern Siberia to Alaska, and then down the West Coast of the United States. All of these were part of globalization because the civilizations that were there often became 
either they absorbed what, the ones who came in or the ones who came in absorbed them. But either way, they were, in a sense, a mix of them both. And as that happened, we had more trade, more communication, and uh, more interaction in all kinds of ways. It's not a recent phenomenon, although it looks that way, because what happened in a year now happened in a century, millennium ago, because, of course, communications were more distant, more difficult, more expensive. To give you just a few numbers, as late as 1930, in dollars and prices, current, virtually current prices, prices of 2000, 2000 a three minute phone call from England to the United States or vice versa costs $300. What does it cost today? Well, if you use Skype, nothing. Uh, it's changed things completely in so many regards, even in our lifetime, but long before that, the first K transatlantic cable wasn't laid till 1850 between London and New York. The one to Chicago didn't come in for several decades later and so on and so forth. You can say the same about shipping and everything else. The cost of bringing goods from one country to another has sunk enormously over time as the cost of transport have diminished, efficiency in shipping has improved and so on. People forget that there used to be pirates all over the place. The cost of shipping fell in half when the United States Navy wiped out the pirate piratical fleet in the Mediterranean. That alone did it in half. The estimated cost of shipping a bushel of wheat to Europe in 1900 was 8%, i.e. less than one-tenth of what it had been 100 years earlier. We have become more and more integrated, and we continue to be more and more integrated. We think those were magnificent achievements, and yet what's happened more recently has made them even look sort of passe and out of date. And the reason I stress this is because most of these things happened because people wanted to happen, people went exploring, uh, people went and did things, not because someone decided we will have globalization. It is not something that can be done or not done simply by a government deciding it. On the other hand, a government can choose whether to, so to speak, go with the flow and support globalization, making sure that perhaps the rough spots of the people within the country are benefit or offset whatever harms come to them along the way. And it can help to smooth the way to the future or the government can fight the whole thing and sort of try and close itself off a bit. And some countries have done so reasonably well. North Korea has virtually cut itself off completely from trade and other communications with the rest of the world. They have among the lowest living standards in the world and their people are suffering, but they do have their independence in that sense, I suppose. China, People's Republic of, did that same thing until the 1980s. And during the first 30 or so years, when there was People's Republic of China, living standards changed very little. And as living standards changed very little, uh, basically they got virtually nowhere. And they changed course because they discovered that what they were doing by way of fighting the rest of the world was not working. So in effect, what's been going on is that we have been having globalization and the successful countries are the ones that have embraced it and then rough, smoothed over its rough edges, not the countries that have fought it along the way. And we, the United States, were one of the ones that were best at that until 2016. We did very well in many, many dimensions. Uh, we were one of the leaders in getting the UN, in getting the multilateral financial institutions, in getting the World Trading Organization, and they have been important. Until the World Trade Organization and before at the GATT, which was the, of which WTO is really an enlarged successor. Before that, uh, countries signed bilateral trading deals. So that, for example, the United States diplomats could sign a deal with France in which it said, we will have a tariff of X percent on this and Y percent on that and so on. And the French would do the same thing for the United States. But the French might, there is no guarantee that the French or the Americans wouldn't turn around and give a better deal to somebody else. You gave up tariffs bilaterally and you can imagine the confusion among other things, but also the reluctance to agree to a tariff schedule with one country where you might just get bested by another one. Getting a multilateral system did away with all of that. It meant that when we set a tariff rate, we set it by and large for the world unless we have something like a free trade agreement as we do with uh, Mexico and with Canada. That's the exception. But even those, that exception has rules within the WTO as to how it would work. And that has enabled world trade to flourish and to become a bigger and a bigger part of world life. And I don't mean trade only in goods. 
one of the mistakes we one sees all the time is people talk about trade and they, they mean things as uh, commodities that you, in a sense you could drop on your feet is the way people describe commodities. In fact, trade and services is the most rapidly growing part of integration at the moment. Financial services, e-commerce, internet, all of those things, cyber, and on and on and on are the parts of the world economy right now where linkages are becoming the greatest. And it, it goes without saying that when those linkages began increasing so rapidly, along about 1700 to 1750 in that range, what also happened was that we had big change in the way the world economy and the world itself was evolving. Until about 1700, the economic historians estimate that living standards in Egypt and England were about the same in 1000, 1000, about the same a thousand years before that, the same a thousand years before that, same about forever. There was very little difference, much the same. About 1700, what began happening is what has been called the great divergence. Living standards in much of the world, Africa, Middle East, South Asia, East Asia, et cetera, did not change very much, a little bit, but not much. While the West plowed ahead and we really did plow. We went first to the point where England was the fastest growing country in the world in the 19th century, raising living standards about one and a half percent per person per year. Now, one and a half percent per person doesn't sound like very much, but when you do it year in and year out over a century, it's a really more than a doubling of living standards by quite a bit. And when other countries do it too, they compete with each other. Each does better because of the others. Uh, the French and the Germans are the Germans first and the Dutch were among the first to see that the British were getting ahead because they'd gone to pretty much free trade. By 1870, most of Europe was doing the same thing and lo and behold, growing more rapidly. In the United States, we did much the same thing. When transport costs were high, it didn't hurt very much that we had some tariffs at relatively low levels. Tariffs might be 20 or 30%, but transport costs were 50 or 60%. By the 20th century, it began mattering. And by 1930, we were beginning leading the world in lowering tariffs and getting multilateral trade increases and tariff reductions because of it. So all of these things have contributed to uh, the increasing globalization. Um, I have no problem in, in communicating with a colleague in, in England, in France, in India, say, say, sending out an email in the morning and saying, what about this item and getting an answer back. Sometimes if it's date, if it's, they're not asleep within a minute or two, but certainly within a day. Obviously, uh, it was much longer than that years ago. The news, it took 12 years, or sorry, yes, 12 years for the news of Lincoln's assassination to reach Japan. It took 90 hours for someone to go from Manchester in England to London in 1700. Now it takes an hour or less by plane. And even by car, it wouldn't be more than a four or five hour trip. We shrunk the world and we've all benefited. We have things that we can't produce ourselves that others produce for us much more cheaply. We have wonderful fresh fruit and vegetables in the winter, uh, despite the fact we can't grow them, but they, but they come from Latin America, from Africa and other places where in the Southern hemisphere. And it makes us all better off. The Southern hemisphere has winter the other part of the year and they import from us. The same thing happens with many other things, but even more important perhaps is the fact that we have competition among our companies in all countries and they all spur each other on. And there's tremendous evidence for that. I like to use the example of the automobile because it's one where the United States was way ahead at the end of World War II. We had, however, only three companies and they were pretty much a monopoly within the US. There was one auto workers union. Uh, the auto workers union represented all three and they would pick out one of the three companies and they'd go on strike every two or three years and they'd insist on a good wage increase, which they would get. Well, if that was not something that the companies could cover out of increased productivity, what they would do is just raise prices and they basically had a monopoly and they could do so. And not only that, the quality of cars is not what you and I are used to. Uh, according to all accounts, if you bought an American made car in about 1970, First off, it was big. There were no small cars here, or very few. It was big, and you took it back to the repair shop four, five, or six times in the first six months. I remember doing it. Uh, for my first car was one that had many, many visits, and I got to know the mechanic of the shop very well and all that. And lo and behold, in came competition, especially in small cars, because the American companies wouldn't make them, but even in the big cars with quality. 
A Japanese car was a miracle because you didn't have to take it back for repairs half a dozen times or 12 times or whatever in the first year or so that you had it. And then American quality increased. Why? Because they had the competition and because that brought them along. Just in time inventory techniques of the Japanese took hold. Some other things took hold. The quality of paint increased enormously. All of these things happened. And of course now we're going through another revolution in autos where we're getting electric cars and all that. And we'll see who comes out ahead on that. But everybody's competing. We don't just have three companies that could get together at the Detroit Economics Club and have a nice lunch and decide what to do. We have companies in the United States. We have companies in Canada, in Germany, Japan, South Korea, China, others all working on this. And with that, it creates a healthier world economy for all of us. It is not a zero sum game. That said, I'll just conclude with a few comments and we can get on with other things. <clears throat> uh, when I first heard President Trump say America first, I was very puzzled. I was very puzzled because I thought we always did that. And I thought part of our being first was that we were part of the international community and that made us part of what we were and it made us something we made us do things that we could be proud of. And I did not understand that he thought there was an inconsistency. Uh, when you talk about sovereignty, I am very puzzled. There is no nothing about sovereignty that will ever let anybody in the United States grow bananas successfully. And believe me, it has been tried. The South Koreans tried it and then they went to Taiwan and they said, how come uh, your bananas are better than ours? And the Taiwanese asked how the South Koreans were growing them. And then uh, they, the Taiwanese got more puzzled and said, well, why isn't this working? And finally said, but you're a cold country. How do you grow them? Well, we grow them in greenhouses. Whereupon they discovered what the problem was. Of course, they got fungus and stuff in the greenhouse. Bananas do not grow in greenhouses. That's all there is to it. And unless you discover a new technology or unless we have global warming, that's not going to change uh, in any time soon. And yet we will all enjoy bananas because there are countries that could do that well, but they don't do so well when it comes to uh, some of the things that happen in the Northern Hemisphere and all that. And I don't think sovereignty is such an absolute concept anyway. After all, if Canada wants to put up a factory that belches smoke and other uh, contaminants just north of the American border, unless we reach an agreement with Canada, we're going to get that smoke and all that stuff. The Canadians, in fact, have been very good because they care about their own environment. But my point is that we are not sovereign in the sense of controlling everything in the rest of the world. One of the sad things in this life was, in fact, the, the attack on the World Health Organization which among most doctors that I know in my family, I come from a family of doctors, believe was one of, was the premier health organization in the world outside the United States. And the American Center for Disease Control and National Institutes of Health were the world-class institution, worked with the World Health Organization and did many things very well. Not perfectly when you're doing things, nobody does it perfectly, but they did better than most others all is most of the time, until of course, we said, well, the Chinese were responsible for this. Certainly the Chinese played some part, we don't know exactly what, but having the, having the World Health Organization there would have helped us all during this past year as we've been going through the pandemic. And I am for one, I'm delighted that President Biden has joined us, has once again joined us so that we're part of it. It helps our doctors because they can learn more, they can get more data. The World Health Organization has collected a lot of data. They were instrumental in Ebola. They virtually wiped out a couple of diseases, including polio and uh, tsetse fly in Africa and so on, many of which have, have benefited the entire world economy. I, not that they did everything right. I, I'm sure that you can name some mistakes, but on the other hand, I can name some mistakes in the United States and everywhere else too. And if your criterion is perfection, we may as well go, go back somewhere and live on our own because we'll never get it, I don't think, in a, in, in a human society just doesn't seem to be on the cards. But it seems to be sovereignty anyway is limited by what our neighbors and the rest of the world will let us do, by the environment, by the climate, by all kinds of things, even by the speed of light. We are not sovereign to change it. And many other things of the same ilk, some of which we have some control over, and we can have more influence and more effect on many of the things we care about internationally by working with others than we can by trying to bully them and beat them over the head, which I fear was much of what the Trump philosophy was. Uh, in terms of the World Trade Organization, which was arguably at least as successful as any other international organization after the Second World War, uh, President Trump basically eviscerated it. What did he do? 
Well, we had a dispute settlement mechanism. If the United States thought China was doing something wrong, according to the WTO rules, we could complain to the dispute settlement mechanism in the WTO or appeal to the WTO, and then we could take it up there and it could be adjudicated. And I must say, it's a little known fact that the Chinese have been better at committing or doing whatever the panel finds or the judges find and the U.S. says the U.S. has won about 90 percent of its cases with China or had the last number I looked, which is two or three years out of date. But of course, since then, we haven't used it anyway. So I don't think it has changed very much. Uh, are we more sovereign because we have no place to settle the disputes with Chinese and with others? I don't think so. I think quite the contrary. We lost something with that. Uh, but I let it go at that and just say that if, to me, uh, the, the ascent of mankind was globalization from beginning to end. It continues to be that way. Governments can fight it, they can slow it down. And in so doing, they can make their citizens worse off or they can go along with it. And when there are some who are harmed, uh, they can find social safety nets and other mechanisms to make that better. There are other things I want to talk about, but I'd like to hear your questions and comments and I'll, re I'll save that for discussion. Thank you. Well, thank, okay. you very, thank you very much, Professor, for uh, that introduction. And uh, we will now open it to uh, two questions from the, the people who have uh, logged on. Uh, and David will uh, help to control the flow of those questions. I might start the ball rolling by posing one myself. Uh, in talking with some people the other day, I was uh, mentioning the, uh, the discussion we've been having today. And the discussion rolled around to uh, this question, if I can try to condense it. Uh, some people would say that globalization writ large appears to be capitalism taken to the nth degree in an exorable drive for efficiency and profitability dictated by the bottom line. How do we tend to the casualties left in, in the wake of, of a system like that? Well, I guess my first part of the answer would be that none of us have found a system in which governments are very good at producing goods and services. And none of us have found a system that can work very well without a government that can produce the things that governments need to produce, which include uh, such basic things as law and order, commercial codes, rules of the road, and, and those sorts of things. There are public services. We at the moment are having a big debate because our infrastructure isn't uh, what it might be. And we think that's unfortunate and we're right. Uh, public health, as we're seeing right now, is an important public service. Education, we've deemed to be a public uh, a public interest in and so on and so forth. And much of the mistakes it seems to me have been made has been to sort of forget that it is, capitalism doesn't mean no government and government control cannot mean no capitalism for the simple people, the simple reason that people will ignore the government when it goes and creates incentives that are too far away from what people want to do. Uh, there, there are wonderful stories of what happens when governments really try to control everything. Uh, and uh, I was reading just the other day that in China, at the time they had severe exchange control, what happened was that people would go and they would buy something like a Rolex, uh, the credit card in China. And then they would go to Hong Kong, they'd return the Rolex, and they'd get foreign exchange, which was illegal for them to get in China. Why? Because the Chinese were trying to restrict foreign exchange so that their citizens couldn't get it. And apparently the market in uh, <laughs> Rolex watches and other ways of getting money from mainland China to Hong Kong was quite efficient and well known and the prices were known and everything else. But of course, then they opened up their market because they couldn't fight it. So uh, I think that there's a uh, confusion there. That said, I think that the systems that have tried to have government production have basically uh, failed except when you take a small part of the economy and pour resources into it at the expense of almost everything else. The Russians did manage, despite very poor economic growth from after, world War, after the First World War on, but especially after the Second World War, the rate of economic growth was very poor. Living standards went up very little, but they were able to get a relatively good, not great, but good military, into, military complex. They poured their resources into that. And of course they had oil, which helped. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, they did not have a good private sector. And that's part of what led to the fall of the Soviet Union was trying that. And I think there are only one or two of the little countries that are left from what was the Soviet Union who even try to maintain government ownership of much of the means of production or uh, the, the companies that make it because most of them have learned their lesson. We know about North Korea and its inefficiencies. Cuba, by the way, just this week, once again, relaxed controls because the system wasn't working. 
finding a way to get people to behave themselves <laughs> and produce profitably and efficiently and productively in a government owned system is a difficult one to have. And I'm always bewildered at Americans who talk about the inefficiencies of government bureau bureaucracy, et cetera. Sometimes I think unfairly too much and simultaneously said, isn't it terrible we have capitalism? Well, in a way, uh, you can't have it both ways. Somebody's got to do it. And we haven't found an intermediate system. We have found things that private sector does better. And we found things the government sector does better. And there's some in the middle. And it seems to me there's quite enough to do to get things the governments need to do to getting them to do well. And most of us think they don't, they should be working on that. And meanwhile, we do need to create a, a level playing field, which needs a commercial code and all that, covering what private sector firms do and making sure that that's consistent with what society wants. So I don't find the this uh, trade meets capitalism. But what I do know is that countries that have not, that have tried to use producer sorry, have production within the government sector, the state enterprises have been almost entirely failures as exporters. Even right today in China, most exports come out of private sector firms. There may be a little bit of government ownership, but they are privately run and privately managed. Thank you. David, do we have any questions? Yes, we have a question from Mary. So she will go first and I will unmute her, so. see. Mary, did you want to go? Okay. I'm unmuted now, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, the first article in this year's Great Decisions book is on global supply chains. And they point out the vulnerability when your country needs something it doesn't produce and it's dependent on another country to meet something it really needs. And they give us examples of uh, China's near monopoly of uh, rare earth metals and uh, antibiotics and other pharmaceutical ingredients and the um, uh, it, it, this wasn't just a Trump thing because Biden uh, campaigned that he would strengthen Buy America programs. And he did January 24th, a few days after he took office, he issued an executive order to ensure our future is made by American labor. And uh, what it was, was that apparently that a government procurement uh, would would be American products made by American labor. So um, maybe, uh, because your emphasis was on from history, especially after the industrial revolution, that those countries that had more, more were more engaged in world trade became more prosperous and did better and lived by better living standards. And that's all true. But this vulnerability thing, uh, especially if a foreign country gets a near monopoly is, is there's something to that also. Well, I don't know. Uh, first off, there is a World Trade Organization agreement, government procurement agreement, which the United States did sign and participates in, which specifies the circumstances under which, including, by the way, national defense, it could, it's okay for the government to take give preferences to its own citizens. But for the most part, its own companies, to, for the most part, government procurement happens in the same as other trade, and it has, it's beneficial. The reason it's been beneficial is because there are lots of things that we, in fact, we we have not export of government procurement because we are good at many of producing many things other governments want. So that in fact, what we get is a lot of goods from producing for other countries with, by the way, good jobs. And with that, uh, we have higher living standards than they buy from us. If we go too far in the Biden direction, and I'll come back to what he did in a minute, what's going to happen is that not only will we pay as taxpayers pay more for some of these goods, but other countries will stop buying from us. So some of our workers will lose their jobs just as more come into the other industries. So that it's by no means assured that we will indeed gain. It may very well be, we've got an export surplus. If they cut off more goods from us in procurement than, they do from, than we do from them, then it's gonna be the other way around and we'll lose jobs with it. So I'm not at all sold on the buy American and the, I think most economists would agree with me. As I said, national defense is a, 
legitimate reason and it is recognized and it is within the WTO articles. Now, what's that, what's good for national defense? In the United States used in the 1950s and 1960, we had oil import quotas to keep oil imports out so that we could use our own oil and have it come out of the ground and be used instead of foreign oil. The argument that was made was national defense. Now, you would think that if you really wanted national defense of, on oil, you'd keep ours in the ground and import more because yes. then, then you were cut off otherwise. And the national defense argument has been used all over the place in strange ways. You use the uh, rare metals example, and it's true that the Chinese do have a lot of them, uh, not all. Chile and a number of other countries. Actually, Siberia has a lot too. Uh, there are some other places that have them and stuff. The Chinese have them most cheaply. Uh, and the Chinese have used that. And until we began saying trade war, they did not do anything to curtail our supply. When we said trade war and began punish, quote, punishing them with these high tariffs and stuff as we did, then the Chinese did retaliate. Just as I said, they will on government procurement if we do that. Now the evidence so far, and I have not looked at it in detail, I'm sorry, if I'd known this would come up, I would have tried to do it before today, but I might not have been able to anyway. But there have been several economists who have looked very carefully at what happened after the start of the pandemic and what happened to our supplies of things and what happened to the supplies from others and so on. The Chinese, by the way, did offer early on when we were so short of personal protective equipment, the PPE stuff, they offered to send us some free and the Biden administration refused. No, Trump. Oh, sorry, the Trump administration. Thank you. <laughs> the Trump administration refused, be, saying they, they wouldn't take it. So the, the Chinese sent it to Europe and to developing countries. Uh, the world trade in pandemic related goods has gone up, not down, during the pandemic. And most of us are better off because of it. I would guess that we're even better off because I don't, I don't know the details uh, that we have, we have, after all, a lead in production of vaccines, getting vaccines tested and reliable and all that and going. But some other countries' competition has probably helped that too. And in the longer run, we're all going to be better off if we could all produce and so on. Now, the second part of that statement, though, is that I know of no, I don't know of every company, but of the companies I know about, and I've checked some, and I've been a director of a couple and so on, and direct other directors who know more about it than I do say the same thing. No sensible company will ever try, will ever rely on only one country for its source of imports if it could possibly avoid it. They may import. 60% of what they need from one country, but they'll try and have at least a couple of alternate suppliers. And they, normally they try and keep one country's share and there are exceptions and they're big ones sometimes, but for the most part, they try and keep it down so that your largest supplier has 40% or something like that. Not that any one of them, because once you have a supplier who's your only supplier, they can hold you up and no company wants that. So even private business isn't gonna do that. So I, I think that this business supply chains actually is, goes the other way around. Namely, it has enabled us to keep research and development and high tech stuff going in this country because we could hive off some of the unskilled labor stuff where our wages are high, which is a good thing. And these can be done in low wage countries. Okay. And so instead of losing out of countries, the whole business, we just lose the low end part. And in, in, and in low wage countries, they get to employ more unskilled labor. And so their wages begin to go up faster. China's wages, by the way, are going up quite rapidly right now. And that's a benefit to us all. Yes, there are people who lose, but I don't think there are countries who lose. Uh, and yes, if you could get a monopoly and protect it, it would be one thing. Uh, and that you do may want to keep some emergency supplies on hand. If there really is rare metal problem, uh, one answer would be, well, let's get an inventory and keep two or three years some stock, it wouldn't be that hard. And then let's make sure that Chile, which is a good source of these things, has some suppliers who are ready to go with us and things like that. And I think a company that depended on rare metals would try and do that. I don't think it's so often that you find monopolies, although China's share of rare metals is admittedly very big, but that's because they've got most of them so cheaply. They are thinking, by the way, of cutting them off now, and that may be a problem. But that would be in response to what Trump did. Another question, David? Okay, our next question is from Warren. So Warren, if you want to pose a question to Dr. Kruger, you may do so. Okay. Um, um, my question is, is as follows. Um, uh, given um, the newness of the Biden administration, where do you think human rights 
should play in the development of U.S. foreign trade policies, particularly with countries that have pretty bad human rights records, China, Egypt, um, and so forth. Uh, how important do you think human rights should be in the development of those global trade policies? It's a good question. And I think, I think there's some room for judgment there, although I, I would say a couple of things. I think all of us would agree we do not want a war with China. And I think most Chinese would agree they don't want a war with us. And I but I say most Chinese, I mean the, the authorities too. And they made that, I think, pretty clear. Uh, a war is almost unthinkable. They are nuclear armed and we are nuclear armed. And in, once a war starts, whichever side is losing would be very tempted to use its bigger weapons and so on and so forth. And that's un almost unthinkable in this day and age. I think we need to think about our relationship with China much the way we did about the, our relationship with Russia. Namely, there are some grounds where in which we can cooperate and there are some grounds on which we have to agree, but neither, we, neither of us will step over a particular line. Uh, in Western Europe, we had that line clear until the Crimean thing, which unfortunately got out of hand, where it was understood that the Russians were not going to push further than that, and we would not do some things pushing further uh, in some parts too. On the other hand, with Russia, we had some other agreements on nuclear disarmament and so on, where they honored them, we honored them, and they went very well until, again, the Trump administration got out of them. So I think it's a tough question because I, I don't think we want to antagonize it. I don't think we want to blockade the Chinese and do them so much damage that they fight back. And I don't think they want to fight back. And there are things they could do to harm us in the same way too. They could invade Taiwan, for example, which is something that would be, from our viewpoint, very undesirable, et cetera, et cetera, many more things. And it seems to me that a sensible policy is going to say, okay, there's, there's going to be strategic. There are going to be some things where there's strategic rivalry. And I believe the following, by the way, that probably on the whole, competition is who can do the better job of producing a better mousetrap or whatever it is, is going to come out ahead. And therefore, good, healthy competition will help us both in the sphere of economic goods. There are a few defense secrets we don't want to get out there and a few other things like that. But on the whole, I would say the trade is something where we need to have trust. The Chinese until the 1990s were not in the WTO. They didn't join. We asked them to join and they wanted to join. They were eager to do so. At that time, their tariffs were, I've forgotten, 50% thereabouts on average. They brought them down over the next decade to 15 and they're lower than that now. And they kept their agreements within the WTO pretty well. They want to be part of the world economy and so on. They want to be number one and so do we, but I think the way to handle that has to be uh, what I'll call a healthy rivalry where we understand that we will not play unfairly by dropping nuclear bombs on each other, but that on the other hand, some forms of competition are okay. Now the human rights thing I agree is terrible, but do you think the Americans, do you really, what, how much do you want to give for that? Uh, obviously I do not think we should say it's perfectly okay. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, I, I can't come to a good clean discussion there, uh, but we, we found, we groped our way to something like that with the Soviet Union when it was the Soviet Union and we did avoid war. And that was the most important single thing. And in some sense, I hope the Biden administration will go that way uh, with China. They already have called back a couple of things the US did that were so very harmful and what's the right, confrontational with China. The Huawei incident was terrible, I think. We said we were going to cut them off from the American market, not allow Americans to use their supplies and stuff. Uh, and we said it was for national defense reasons. Then when the president, when President Trump discovered that some American companies were dependent on Huawei for supplies they needed, he rescinded the order. So was it national defense or was it something else? <laughs> and, I, and what we've learned over time is that you don't get protect American industries to make them more competitive. That's not the way to do it. Strengthening research, things like that can do it. Getting good, better training and training institutes can do it. Other things that can help strengthen the economy, better infrastructure could do it. Getting our post office working again even would help. Uh, there's so many, seriously, it's doing a lot of damage. And there are things like this that we can and the government should do, but I'm not sure that cutting off trade or saying we will punish you uh, with that. The next thing about trade, just to be continue, is we have used a lot of what we call sanctions, penalizing other countries. And the trouble is once you cut them off, First off, third countries are going to go around and eat your lunch to some extent. Uh, secondly, and perhaps equally important, you can't use it again because you've already done it. 
And if you say, we're going to punish you by not letting you do any trade, then what they do next, they've got no disincentive to do because there's no way to punish them with that. And it's, I would argue that we have overused sanctions and other things, first off, because we overestimated how powerful we were. And secondly, because we forgot that there are third countries that could come in and eat. Vietnam has benefited enormously from Trump's tariffs with China. And so finally, in the last week of his administration, he was trying to call Vietnam a currency manipulator because their exports to the United States went up so much. And that's, of course, because the Chinese <laughs> things went through there. And uh, the trading system is very hard to muck with unless everybody does it. And you, virtually universal sanctions can work. They, South Africans say they work there, but that was because almost every country in the world honored those sanctions. But the, as soon as some countries are not involved in it, it's a very different story. It's an excellent answer, Professor. Thank you. David, another okay. question? Dr. Kruger, we have a question from John. He says, you refer to the rough patches experienced by badly affected people, i.e. those who lose jobs to technological advances and or foreign competition. How might the U.S. government and state governments respond to help those people adjust to these changes? Well, I think we should have a better social safety net. I do not think it should be a safety net for people hurt by trade. And I can give you so many reasons for that that I could take the rest of our time plus to give you the answers. But let me, let me tell you by an example that actually happened to me many years ago. Uh, I was a new, pretty new assistant professor and I was invited and very thrilled to be invited to be a research advisor to the Committee for Economic Development, which at that time was the association of very large businessmen. And they were trying to get some good research done for e on economic policy in the United States. And they had this research advisory group of which I had been invited to join. So I went to my first meeting of that group in I think 1975. And I was sitting at lunch next to a CEO of a very large company. I knew about the company. I'd heard his name. I was very impressed. I had no idea what you say to a CEO. Uh, but in the preceding, well, three or four months before that, New York Times had run a series of three articles talking about a factory in Newark that this, company, this CEO had shut down uh, because of trade. And the headline was Trade Harms American Workers. And then it went on and he, the enterprise that reported did a very good job. He went out and he found some workers who had found another job at the same pay. He found some workers who were, had taken retirement and so on. And so some workers had gotten more training and so on and so forth. But on average, workers were being paid 15% less than they had been before all this. So I started my question to him. I thought I'd ask him about this layoff because losing these workers into work and so on, what happened? And I was going to ask him what he thought of the article. And so I, did, I started my comment by saying, I saw the three articles about your plant closure in Newark because of trade last week. And he just laughed. He said, yes, but it wasn't because of trade. We move our factory south. And are you going to tell a union in Newark, New, New, in New Jersey, that you're, that you're, move, you're closing it down because they, they get away from unions in the south? Or are you going to tell them it's import competition? <clears throat> to give you one example. But in most industries, when things go wrong, it's a combination of things. And again, the steel industry is a perfect case in point. As of last year, it was estimated that it took one man to produce, or one, for every 10 men it took in 1980 to produce a ton of steel, it took one man in 1990. They cut their labor requirements by 90% because of technical change much of which was, by the way, recycling and stuff that the environment thinks is good and so on and so forth. With all of that, uh, what, what happened was that, um, I've lost my train of thought here, I'm sorry for the moment. Uh, we, get, we get technical change involved and when there's technical change, there's likely also to be technical change more likely in the industries that use more unskilled labor because that's where you need to save more because it's so expensive in uh, this country, which is what we want. We want people to get more trading and be more productive, but we don't want necessarily them to keep low, uh, poorly paid jobs. So with that, what happens is uh, that we get companies that, the well, companies are closing factories are probably ones with probably not the best management, probably the ones that have probably a poor location in some cases, possibly too strong a union, uh, possibly other things uh, that basically don't work. Uh, so uh, there are a number of reasons. So now how do we tell? Here's a factory that was laid off. How many workers are we going to help because they were hurt by trade? How many by technical change? It makes no sense. 
To me, what makes sense is to say, we need a social safety net. I tried to cut this off, I think I missed. Uh, we need a social safety net that uh, will, will cover anybody who's unemployed, but we need to do it, I think, along lines that have been very successful in Northern Europe. I don't know what to do about this. I'm sorry, I thought I cut it off ahead of time. Um, <laughs> he's stubborn. But at any event, uh, with all of that, when we need in, the, in Scandinavia, they have workers' centers in each big town or city. And a workers' center has some people who are called counselors. It has some who, call, who are called business informants and so on. And they also have advisory groups of, of, uh, of uh, businessmen, head of business, and so on and so forth. The advisory groups talk about who they hired, what training they had, how good the training was, and how it could be improved. Whenever a firm is going to lay off some workers, I'm sorry about this. When they lay off some workers, what happens is uh, that they inform the counselor or the labor center these workers are going to be laid off. The workers come into the labor center. The counselor already knows that the worker's skills, what, he, what certificates he has and so on. They know where jobs are available and they can send them to them. And they can sometimes say, well, look, you need this certificate and that experience before you can get a good job here and they'll pay for the training. But the law, Danish law basically says that unless you are actively looking for work or in a training program or getting some more education, some form or other, you don't get unemployment compensation. And what they've done is made the unemployment compensation higher, but they've also said made the training requirements and skill requirements and so forth, something that you have to do. You can't just sit and wait for a job to come to you. And what makes that work? Well, we don't know for sure how it works at well, and every one of them is different in each Scandinavian country. But the last I saw, the unemployment rate in Denmark for long-term unemployed was 2.3%, which has never been achieved here. And combining these things so that the same things go through is a lot of good things. It means that technical institutes that do bad training don't get students there because the labor counselors won't finance it. Because the employers have said, look, we hired so-and-so from such and such a training institute. He didn't know what he was doing. And it's, it means then that the training institutes have to be on their toes. The, the trade, workers get good training. And they get training in the new things and not just unemployment and saying, well, I was a steel worker and so I can't do anything and so I'm getting unemployment. But in my view, what you do in those towns where they're in trouble is find out what's going on. Now in Denmark, which I know better than the others, they even pay for workers to go to other cities to find a visitor job there if they can't find one at home. They also pay moving expenses when indeed uh, there's a good job found in another uh, place and not one at home. So they do a lot more to help the unemployed as the unemployed find other, find other work, but they don't pay as much just for unemployment comp without any questions. Here, you can't do that right now because the records aren't even together. The people who have the records on unemployment comp don't have the records on training and the records on training don't go with other things. And so everyone is a separate uh, file just as it is right now, by the way, for vaccines, which is why there's trouble there. Uh, you've got to consolidate these things so you've got the records you need. So my argument would be that yes, trade is a part of it, Technical change is far more important. There are lots of reasons why, people, why companies close and lay off workers. We don't want to discourage that so much as we want to make sure the workers do well in what goes after that and help them with that and get much, much stronger and strengthened uh, what's called active labor market policies in Scandinavia. Okay, Dr. Kruger, we have another question. This is from Mary Ann. Uh, she asks about the nexus between globalization and labor wage levels and the effect of a $15 minimum wage. <laughs> Another good and important question at the moment. Um, well, let me give you two stories. The first one of which goes back to the 1980s when I was asked to come as an advisor to the government of Papua New Guinea, uh, which had gotten its independence some 10 years before. I uh, had 700 languages or something like that on many islands, et cetera, et cetera. And they were trying to industrialize, which was interesting given their geography and everything else. And to do so, they'd set up some factories. Uh, and they also had a minimum wage law like all industrial countries. And their minimum wage was something like seven times that in the Philippines. And one of the factories they set up, which I happened to stumble across, there were others which had the same problem, was that um, basically in the, in the uh, they built a chopsticks factory in uh, Papua New Guinea. Why? Well, because Papua New Guinea had a lot of wood and so it would be good to make it. They thought the chopsticks factory. The trouble was that the late was this unskilled labor business. It doesn't take a lot of skill to make chopsticks out of wood and then polish them or shellac them or whatever you do. 
And the trouble with that was that the Philippines minimum wage was one seventh. And so the cost of making chopsticks in uh, a chopstick in the Philippines at the labor cost was greater than the total cost. Sorry, in Papua New Guinea was greater than the total cost uh, in the Philippines, they couldn't do it. Second story, Puerto Rico is subject to US mainland minimum wages and it's a poorer place. The labor force participation rate is 38%. Why? Well, the minimum wage is so high that employers can't employ everybody. So lots of people just started in the labor force. They're doing informal jobs. They're not in the record system or anything else. You can't say, should there be a minimum wage or should there not be? The question is how high should the minimum wage be so that it in fact does not deprive our unskilled workers of their jobs, but on the other hand, doesn't let employers uh, pay too low a wage either, as happens occasionally in small towns and places like that. We make one mistake in having the same minimum wage for New York City and Washington, DC, as we have for Southern Mississippi. Costs of living are much lower in Southern Mississippi, and the same nominal wage, the same number of dollars per week in Mississippi goes a lot further than it does here. So why do we have the same minimum wage? Even having it by state or having a national minimum wage where we had a state cost of living and adjusted it. So if we found out that in Mississippi, a cost of 45% lower then the minimum wage would be 45% lower and so on. Uh, there is a way to do that. And there is a way to make it sensible. My guess is that 750 is pretty low right now in the US. My guess is that somewhere going up to uh, 11 or $12 over the next two or three years, phasing it in gradually, to give employers time to adjust might make sense. From what I've seen, and there's not a lot of evidence, but from what I know, my sense is that going to $15 very quickly would probably lead to more unemployment. And there was a recent Congressional Budget Office story, uh, study, uh, where they published the situation, the CBO's best estimates are that yes, you would get something like, I've forgotten, uh, 800,000 workers would have their, I forgot the numbers, but there'd be a lot of workers who would lose their jobs. There would be some who would get more pay. And they didn't say which was the better because obviously the workers who are paid less than the minimum wage who get more are better off, but the people who lose their jobs are worse off. So minimum wage is a tough one. And I don't have a full answer, except to say that there can be one that's so high as in Puerto Rico that it does real damage. And, and for that matter, probably getting that it does real damage. And there can be one that's so low that it doesn't make any difference. When it's so low, raising it a bit, is probably desirable up to a point, but that's still what you wanna be sure you're not cutting out too many workers from the labor force. Okay, we have a question, Dr. Kruger from Bill. So let me... Good afternoon, Dr. Kruger. Um, my question, uh, involves, uh, I'd like to follow up on your comments about uh, employment and unemployment and what will be the impact of the coronavirus on the workplace across the United States? Another very good question. And one in which there is a lot of debate among economists and others right now as to what will happen. And opinions differ. Uh, some people think that because people are so much working place at home, we'll never get back as much to the central city as we did. Others disagree with that. Um, I, I, I do not have a firm opinion. Uh, I think that we, we need to sort of let things flow in a sense, that we don't need to decide it will be A or B, but we need to do some of the things we can do anyway and then let people decide what they want to do. If you make me make my guess, I think we will see more people going back into going to workplaces rather than working at home. But how far that will go, whether it will be sort of, if we went, if we fell down 50% working at home from 10%, whether we then go back up to 50% uh, or we go to 40% or whatever, or 10%, I just don't know. And my, a lot of indicators are, uh, little things I know about suggest that people like to go to work. Uh, I have friends, of course, whose kids are, or his grandkids are driving them crazy as they try to work. And some of those people I'm sure will go back. Uh, we have other people who carefully moved out of the big city and into some place, a rural area because they could do their work from there and they probably won't go back. Uh, how much of each of those there is, I don't know. Uh, I did have a friend at one point uh, who was a, at that time a director of Bell Labs. And Bell Labs at that time had just come out with the conference phone call where you could put the phone in the center of the table. Everybody could sit around the table. And he told me uh, that, there, that the man top management of the whole company 
at and that which was at that time a monopoly, had set out an order, and they said they wanted 75 percent at least of meetings, which involved people from different pro, uh, places, to be by conference and cut down the travel budget to 25 percent of the meetings. And apparently, at and rescinded it after about nine months because it didn't work as well when people didn't have the informal contacts and so on. And just as I'm doing this with you, I give talks often to other economists and so on, where I've been at their talks or they've been at mine or both. And some of the informal conversation before and afterward is important and I miss it. I'm much better off with Zoom and WebEx and all that than I'd be without it. But on the other hand, I am missing uh, some part of that. And I'm feeling that more as time goes by. So I, I just can't give you one straight answer uh, because that's it. Now, the second thing I think is we are going to be paying more attention to public health. I suspect that we will get this virus under control, but not we will not eradicate it. The experts say that, and it makes sense. We're already seeing variations. And of course, the cold virus changes from year to year, but it's been managed in such a way that it's not the same thing. The flu virus even changes from year to year, and they change the, uh, the, the shot formula a little bit. I'm sure we'll go to that, but I think over time, we're also going to take more offense when somebody says, uh, I, I have every right to uh, be close to you and sneeze, you know, without a mask and things like that. How far that will go, I don't know, but I, th I think we're going to see more sensitivity. We're now up to more than 500,000 Americans died because of COVID virus already, and the deaths haven't stopped. And not only that, uh, that so many have died, uh, but that's more than even died in World War II. It's a huge number. And of course, many more people are affected or will be affected. I'm pretty much self-isolated since last March. I'm in that age group that you're supposed to be very careful. Oh, not only that, I have a sister who is an epidemiologist and she insists on it. And if I dared tell her I was going out somewhere, I think she'd kill me to save the trouble of the hospital. <laughs> she just, she's, and of course she knows, she's seen these, and she was in on the Ebola, she was in on swine flu with these, and so she knows about these, and she worked with Dr. Fauci and all that. So she knows about some of these things. And uh, she thinks that the, you know, I think that the public health appreciation in this country could and should go way up. That's my view. But it is an opinion and nobody knows. Thank you. You're welcome. That's an interesting observation, uh, Professor. I uh, actually clipped out an article from yesterday's Washington Post in which they were addressing this. And apparently there's a, I, I'm not familiar with this institution, the McKinsey Global Institute. It's the supposed. Yes, they'll be issuing a report uh, later this week in which they're saying that about 20% of workers could end up working from home indefinitely. And uh, they're also projecting a 20% uh, uh, diminution in business travel uh, in, in the United States. And, and generally saying they thought quite a few jobs would be lost uh, after the pandemic due to increased uh, automation throughout this period. So. Uh, as you say, it's it's difficult to predict, but uh, everyone's having a stab at it. It seems. Well, Mackenzie is is repu is reputable, and that's uh, certainly on the uh, working at home twenty. If you told me twenty percent was a number, it's as good as any I know of, and it, it sounds about right in many ways because there are reasons why they will and reasons why they won't. That part's okay. Uh, as to automation, I'm sure automation was going on anyway. There'll probably be a bit more of it because it always is to some extent in, in these kinds of circumstances. How much more there will be, I don't know. There may be other things coming along that are automated or uh, that need workers. Uh, that are, one of the things, just to give you an example, uh, that everybody said when ATMs came in, the automatic cash machines or automatic teller machines and banks, everybody said, everybody, we're going to lose jobs from this because we'll no longer need bank tellers. In <laughs> fact, more bank tellers than ever. Uh, ATMs led, led to a change in what the banks do to some extent, but they didn't lead to a loss of jobs in banking. And that very often happens that the new, uh, the new innovation does occur. Some of the tellers who's out there just handed out a bit of cash for the most part went, but at the same time it created demands for other things uh, that offset the losses and in fact outweighed them. So it's just very hard to say what will happen to automation. That's what people, I, I'm pretty old. And I think that the first time I heard that automation was going to kill jobs was when I was still an undergraduate, which would be 1950s. All the discussion was how automation was going to kill all jobs. I, the same thing in the 1960s, the same thing in the 90s. We've heard it and heard it and heard it. And every time there's been truth to it in the sense that some industries have lost workers or have laid off workers or have lost jobs because they couldn't, the product was no longer in demand. But at the same time, 
until COVID hit, we were at full employment. We were at the lowest unemployment rate we'd seen in a large number of years. So while there were job losses away along the way, there were also job gains. They weren't always the same people, and some people benefited more than others, and there were towns that were hit. But nationally, we, we, we did not lose jobs. We gained them. David, any other questions out there? Yes, we have a question from Larry. He asked, the dollar is the world's reserve currency, and at the same time, the U.S. is becoming a de debtor nation. Even though historically being a debtor na nation seems to have resulted in bad outcomes, will the dollar's function as a reserve currency somehow save us from those bad outcomes, he asks. <laughs> Another good question, but a very complicated one. Um, let me start with a simple proposition, which helps a bit. And that is that if I go out and borrow from the bank and then go take a wonderful around the world trip and do some other things, uh, that perhaps aren't of the, uh, that don't in any way increase my earning ability or stuff. And then I have to pay it off. I'm going to be worse off, right? Because I got to cut other expenditures to pay back that debt and pay interest on it. On the other hand, if I've got a brilliant idea that I'm going to do a startup and it's going to pay off big time, and I go to the bank and I borrow the same amount of money, and I, I'm right about it, so the startup does well, it was a good thing to borrow the money. So debt isn't either, either good or bad. Uh, it depends what you do with it and how it comes out that makes the difference. And unfortunately, some of our borrowing has been pretty much for consumption and not for investment, uh, which makes it more likely that there's a little problem with it later on, but not while interest rates are this low, which is important to remember. Now, the second thing I want to say about this is reserve currency is to be a reserve currency, other countries had to get demand of our currency. They had somehow to do it. So what did they do? They bought up bonds and things in the United States. They get made, got bank deposits in the United States and so on. And so what happened was they wanted the dollars, which is what gave us the deficit. Because they wanted to get exports to us, their exports to us, so they could have the dollars to do what they want to do with them. So in effect, our reserve currency came about precisely because it's an ironic thing. A strong currency is one that has strong exports. But if you become a reserve currency, other people want to hold your currency. So then they have to get more exports in order to do it. And so that's a factor. The third thing I would say is the Chinese are trying very hard. And it looks as if they're being marginally successful in cutting into the U.S. dollar roll and trying to get do things to make the yuan more uh, used as a, as a reserve currency internationally. And they are not there yet. The European Union thought that it could do it when they adopted the euro. They thought they could do it. And maybe the euro holdings of other countries, banks, central banks, and so on, is going a bit, but not a lot. The U.S. is still the reserve currency, but it's not quite as strong as it was. And depending on what happens in the future, we could see uh, the evolution either of the or, or both of the Chinese and European Union uh, as, as also reserve currencies, and you could have multiple reserve currency system, or the dollar could lose its role. Whether it loses its role, I think, depends very much on our own monetary fiscal policy and, and uh, all that. Okay, uh, Dr. Kruger, Bill had a follow-up question, so really quickly. Uh, Dr. Kruger, uh, do you have an opinion on Bitcoin? <laughs> uh, I have my opinion, but again, oh, I have my opinion, and I know the opinion of some people I respect very much who's whose field it is. I do trade, they do monetary stuff. So I, I do a little bit on exchange rates, but I don't do so much on the farm exchange rate side. I've written on it a bit way back when, but the field has gotten more complicated. That said, the people I know and trust don't think Bitcoin is going to take over as a currency. And the reason is very simple. There's no control over it. Uh, you need a legal tender within the country, a good, no, private can't, private coin can't do it. Now you can have things that are like money. We have credit cards. They're in near money. I can go into a store today with no cash and I can buy something with my credit card. And of course, then I'll pay the credit card off, but that's the same as signing an IOU now, but it's still near money. So the, the, we will have more of that. And we have had more of that. We've had credit cards spring up. We've had all kinds of straight things spring up uh, that make us, the near banks as they're called, or the non-financial non, non banks are a real thing. So Bitcoin or other of those will, I think, take up more space probably 
But as you know, right recently, what this week? This week, didn't Bitcoin go up to fifty thousand dollars or something? It was eighteen thousand a year ago. I mean, fluctuating all over. Okay, thank you. But at any event, whatever it is, it's fluctuating all over the place, and I certainly wouldn't want to trust it uh, with, with with my savings. Let me put it that way. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, David. Okay, do we have any other questions from our participants? If, if we don't, uh, maybe to just fill in some space waiting for another question. Uh, Professor Kruger, uh, President uh, Trump, as you know, withdrew from the proposed uh, Trans-Pacific Agreement, uh, Partnership Agreement in January 2017. The remaining 11 countries then formed the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, and that took effect in December of 2018. Subsequently, in November of last year, China and 14 other countries formed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Uh, and there's an overlap between those two organizations in terms of membership. What should the Biden administration now seek to do? Join the former, the latter, both, or neither? And <laughs> what would organized laborers uh, approach to this be? Would they oppose it much as they did before? Well, I'll, well, let me start with what happened, which is, of course, as you said, the Trans-Pacific Partnership was negotiated in the Obama years. It was to be 12 countries around the Pacific, including Japan, including Australia, New Zealand, including the others, so up to 12. Uh, and basically, the U.S. was insisting on some things that the others weren't too happy with. Oh, I should add Mexico, Canada were in it, of course, Chile and stuff too. But in any event, the, the, the U.S. Was, under Obama were insisting on some things that uh, weren't all that welcomed by the, the other 11, but they nonetheless went along. And all, one of the very first things President Trump did was to re ab abdicate whatever you call it, when he signed out of the TPP or the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So he withdrew. The Japanese then took the leadership. And they took most of the articles of the TPP, except for those few that the U. I think 22 articles the U.S. had wanted that they didn't want, so they took out. Except for that, it's the same agreement. Okay, mm -hmm. and the uh, and they also announced that if the U.S. wanted to rejoin, the U.S. would be welcome to do so. I think that I've never seen that statement. I think it means that the U.S. could rejoin, and the 22 articles would be reinstated. But I don't know that. I, I just assumed that that may be wrong. I should look that up. But be that as it may, uh, the TP, the Trans, the, the, the Progressive Trans Pacific Progressive Trade Partnership, whatever <laughs> those initials are, is an active going thing. What, what's really interesting about it is that because of it, there are free trade between Japan and Australia and so on and so forth. And Japan, by the way, has a free trade agreement with the European Union as well. What that means is that U.S. automobile producers trying to sell, for example, in the Australian market are subject to Australian tariffs. Japanese producers trying to sell in the Australian market are not because of free trade. The same for wheat. American wheat going into Japan pays a tariff. Pretty high it was. They're lowering it somewhat, but it was a 38%, I think. And on the other hand, Australian wheat could come in duty-free. 38% cheaper. Canadian also. So what President Trump did was disadvantage American producers relative to those of the other 11 countries. And I think that there would be strong support from the farm community particularly uh, for going back into the TPP. I think there are strong political, geopolitical reasons for going back in. Uh, the Obama administration said, and it was his declared policy, that the Chinese were, quote, not ready at this time to go in, but would be considered later. And I. The Chinese didn't exactly like that, but I think they took it. Uh, and so basically what we have here is a situation where we had negotiated an agreement, everybody bowed to what we wanted to do, and then we pulled out. Uh, it doesn't make us the most reliable negotiating partner in the world, but we did it. And I think that he, we should go back in. I think we should go back in and go in fairly humbly, actually, given what we did. Uh, and then recognize that having done that, uh, we're going to get enormous re advantage, I guess is the word, re-advantaged in our trade with Japan uh, and with Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, uh, Singapore, and so on. So there are the countries where we, we have lost out on account of it and we could get it back. So my view is strongly re-enter it. Uh, now, having said that, entering a free trade agreement or a preferential trade agreement like Customs Union is, can be good depending on how you do it. 
the lower your tariffs are to the rest of the world, the less likely there could be any harm from entering it. If your tariffs are higher, then you're going to be cutting off more cheap goods to get more expensive ones from overseas, and it's not so good. So both of those things could happen. In the case of uh, the TPP, I th it seems to me that the getting the cheaper things outweighs it, and there was not that much that was danger of diverting it in ways that would be harmful. So I'm all for going back into the TPP, and I'm all for getting so getting the WTO back up and functioning again. I'm also for getting some kind of a wise men's group or something to propose uh, some of the changes to the WTO that some people think are necessary and see if we can get some agreement on that and get the multilateral system going again. That's very important. Good, thank you. David? Okay, we have a question from, let me see here. Um, Rhonda, so Rhonda, do you want to speak? Yes. Um, hello, Dr. Kruger. Um, I was in a class, uh, in a couple classes, one on China and one on inclusive economies. But um, the China course talked a lot about this. Uh, I forgot what it's called, the Belt Initiative that China has, mm -hmm. where they're trying to expand. I mean, it's kind of the expanded Silk Road idea where they're out in many countries developing, putting money in and mm -hmm. doing lots of things that will um, obviously gain them more um, influence and strategic influence as well. Is there something that you think the United States should be doing to kind of um, expand our strategic influence or counteract that kind of, those kind of moves? Or do you think, also do you think coronavirus has uh, kind of slowed everything down? It seemed they were going very quickly. What's your opinion on that? But when we, you're asking a very good question, and it's a pretty complicated one. The Belt and Road Initiative, of course, is to have a transport, mostly land route, all the way from China, all the way uh, through, well, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, India, and so on, all the way into Europe. Uh, that's the Chinese idea, would go through the stands, Grand Sun, and so on and so forth, and so it linked China more closely by road. Uh, the Chinese have invested quite a bit in infrastructure. A lot of it they've done by lending to the countries or getting something in return, some of which has made people here nervous as it might. I think in the case of Sri Lanka, uh, the Sri Lankans borrowed to build or build up the port. Uh, I may have the story slightly wrong, but the, the essence of it is approximately the following, to build up port facilities so the Chinese can bring their ships in there. And then something happened so the Sri Lankans weren't repaying as they stood, so the Chinese claimed ownership of some of the ports, which bothers everybody. And, and, and so that's one thing, but there have been other stories like that too. Pakistan is another big borrower from China. And Pakistan is trying to get a loan from the International Monetary Fund because otherwise it can't repay its debt. And of course, there are, I think, bound to be complaints as there probably should be, uh, that other creditors are be having to lose a little bit of money and the Chinese are standing there and not participating in this. And I mentioned earlier that I think the Chinese and the U.S. have a great deal, U.S. and the rest of the world, a great deal to gain by keeping trade as one of the things we do together. I think actually managing debt crises in poor countries is another one where there's very much a need for international cooperation. Uh, and in this case, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative has lent where some of the monies have not been as well spent as they might be, or the traffic hasn't picked up or whatever. And so that's already being part of the problem of Chinese investment there and uh, is something of an issue. I think we should be, do we, we are ri a rich country. And I do think America is first until President Trump decided that he didn't want it that way anymore. He used the wrong motto in my view. But in any event, I do think that we, we have something of an obligation to make sure that there are international rules of the game that are fair and let developing countries have a chance. And if we do that and do that right, uh, I think, and strengthen our own economy, I think that's the best we could do for them. Keeping trade open for developing countries is just hugely important. Uh, no country, no, no, no country that was, regarded as developing after World War II has really had successful economic growth and <clears throat> raised living standards enormously without opening up trade, except in a few cases where they had an oil find or something like that. <clears throat> okay, we have just a few minutes left and time for maybe a couple questions. Um, another one by Larry. Like you said, a lot of U.S. debt seems driven by consumption rather than investment, Dr. Kruger. Put another way, it seems a lot of U.S. debt seems driven by tax cuts for the rich, which has exacerbated income inequality in the U.S. Can you opine on this issue and also about 
in income inequality on a global basis? <laughs> uh, a, a short and quick part of the answer on global is very simple. World or global inequality taken as income in, 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 per capita incomes between countries. If you just count each country as one unit, okay? Income inequality between countries has gone down. It's much less than it was. India used to be 3% of our income is 10. 10 is a lousy number, but it's better than three and so on. So if you take between countries, income inequality has gone down. Within the US, it's clearly gone up. Much of that has clearly been technical change. And I think it, it would be fair to say, broad approximation, that until about 1980, the rate of technical change was about the same as the rate at which the skills of the American labor force were increasing. The skills were, the number of university graduates was rising, the fraction that didn't even have a high school degree was falling, and it seemed to work pretty much in court and real wages for the unskilled were rising. After about 1980, the rate at which we got more credentials for our labor force diminished greatly. And our inequality began rising. Much of, some of that of course is some technical change, but some of it also is that we have not kept up on the education side. I mentioned I wanted active labor market policies, part of which would be to upgrade the skills of the labor force. And that would help a lot too. That would be a lot more uh, useful. As to the tax cuts, obviously um, there are a number of things there. How much, it, I haven't seen any numbers as to how much it added to inequality. The corporate tax code was a mess. The average the stipulated tax rate was 39 or 38%. The highest paying sector corporations were paying tax was 28. There were so many loopholes and so on uh, that companies were, some companies weren't paying any profits tax at all, even though they made profits. And the, I, I did believe and still believe that the corporate profits tax needed to be changed. So it was a lower rate, but I also thought with fewer exemptions and the Congress in its wisdom got the lower rate, but didn't cut exemptions as much as I think they should, which is part of the problem there. Uh, otherwise, uh, part of the union, a lot of, it seems to me that it's all fine and good to talk about raising taxes somewhat. We may need to, but I don't think you could talk about just quote taxing the rich because there aren't enough rich to pay the bill for the infrastructure and stuff that we need. And, and I think we need a broader base than we have and slightly increased taxes, maybe one or two percentage points for most people and maybe three or four for the very rich as graded in between. But more than that, I don't think that's the answer. I think more education and training and some of these other things. Right now, as you know, there's a proposal from Senator Romney for a child uh, income support which is another way of effect, affecting the income inequality problem that looks somewhat promising. There's a proposal for everybody being guaranteed a basic income scheme. That may have some promise. There are a number of these things going on. I agree that we need to do something to assure that everybody uh, does a little bit better than they do now when they're in trouble. How we do that, I think is still up for debate. And I just don't know enough to sort of say, I know this is a better way. I'm not at all sure of it. I think there is judgment involved. By the way, a lot of these things we're talking about are, I've done more in my new book, which I thought you were at least going to mention uh, at the beginning or the end, which is from Oxford University Press called International Trade, What Everyone Needs to Know. And it just came out last October and it's got most of the things you've been uh, asking about. I've been trying to give you know one, one paragraph or one sentence answer, one or two paragraph answers to things that in the book I take a chapter on. And it's still not that long a book. So you might want to look at that. Thank you, David. Uh, I don't have any further questions at this point, so. Could I, could I sneak in one more for the professor? Uh, in, in your article, uh, Dr. Kruger, you expanded a bit on, on uh, uh, the separation of the global economy into regional uh, preferential trading agreements. I imagine much like the TPP would be. How, how would that really work going forward in the world uh, grouped into these various divisions and where might the UK end up just having now left the EU? <laughs> Another good question. Uh, and of course, part of where it will end up will be political and not economic. Uh, and of course the UK could end up going back into the European Union at some future date, although I think they'd have to swallow quite a bit of humble pie to get there right now, but uh, we'll see about that. Uh, what I said was that given the way things were going in the protection, I'm sorry, given, given the protectionist pressures uh, that have come up. If the US does not 
go back to supporting the WTO and so on. Then what happens is there's more protection in the world economy. And there are a lot of countries that won't go it alone. Quite a few of them will gang up, as we already have in the European Union. You might get more members there. You might get an Asian Union, or you might get an Asian, East Asian and South Asian. Uh, I would guess Africa would go with Europe. US might go with all of Latin America rather than just Mexico and Canada. And you could get regional blocks. Clearly that would be less desirable than having an open multilateral trading system, which is what we had. I think also that the countries that don't get so protectionist will do better than countries that do. And as that happens, more people will want to go back to our uh, former system of having the more open trading system. It gets very complicated to do preferential trading arrangements in all kinds of ways. And uh, there are just lots of things that don't work. In Chile, they began lowering their tariffs, but also at the same time, doing preferential trading agreements with everybody. They were almost the champion of the world in doing these with Brazil, with uh, the United States, with everybody. And at the same time doing pre uh, lowering tariffs. And the businessmen's community finally went to them and said, look, just get one low tariff rate and forget all this. Do 5% for everybody. We'll take a lower tariff as long as we don't have to worry about which country gets what preferential rate. And as long as we don't have delays in customs as the customs inspectors are trying to figure out what and when happens on which tariff on which good and all the rest of it. And I think that will happen in a number of cases. And I think we will eventually get back uh, to a multilateral system. How much we lose in the meantime, I think is the real question of whether we go through this regional block group thing or whether we get right back to it. I, and I'm more hopeful with Biden than I was with Trump that we might get back more quickly, but I can't say for sure. Thank you. David, any final questions? No, I didn't see any at the moment, so. Well, then I think that leaves it to me to just on behalf of everyone who has joined us today to very, very heartily thank Professor Kruger for her sterling contribution uh, to expanding our knowledge on, on this subject of uh, economic globalization. Doctor, we're really very, very much in your debt and we thank you sincerely for giving so liberally of your time today to be with us. Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed the questions, some of which were very hard. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> go and uh, go and relax now. Thank you again, Professor. Thank you. Bye. -bye. <laughs>